the Aeneid by Virgil. If you are returning to the Classic Masterworks channel, welcome back. If you are new, please don't forget to like and subscribe and hit the bell notification so that you will be made aware of our latest content. And now, on with the story. Book 6. The Vision of the Underworld So speaks he weeping, and gives his fleet the rein, and at last glides into Euboikuma's coast. They turn the prows seaward, the ships grounded fast on their anchor's teeth, and the curving ships line the beach. The warrior band leaps forth eagerly on the Hesperian shore. Some seek the seeds of flame, hidden in veins of flint. Some scour the woods, the thick coverts of wild beasts, and find and shoe the streams. But good Aeneas seeks the fortress where Apollo sits high enthroned, and the lone mystery of the awful Sibyl's cavern depth, over whose mind and soul the prophetic Delion breathes high inspiration and reveals futurity. Now they draw nigh the groves of trivia and the roof of gold. Daedalus, as the story runs, when in flight from Minos, realm he dared to spread his fleet wings to the sky, glided on his unwanted way towards the icy northern star, and at length lit gently on the Chalcidian fastness. Here, on the first land he retreated, he dedicated his winged oarage to thee, O Phoebus, in the vast temple he built. On the doors is Andragius' death, thereby the children of Cecrops, bidden, Ami, to pay for yearly ransom seven souls of their sons, the urn stands there, and the lots are drawn. Right opposite the land of Gnosis rises from the sea, on it is the cruel love of the bull, the disguised stealth of Pasiphae, and the mingled breed and double issue of the Minotaur, record of a shameful passion, on it the famous dwelling's laborious inextricable maze, but Daedalus, pitying the great love of the princess, himself unlocked the tangled treachery of the palace, guiding with the clue her lover's blind footsteps. Thou too hadst no slight part in the work he wrought, O Icarus, did grief allow. Twice had he essayed to portray thy fate in gold, twice the father's hands dropped down. Nay, their eyes would scan all the story, in order, were not Ice already returned from his errand, and with him the priestess of Phoebus and Trivia, Diphobe daughter of Glaucus, who thus accosts the king, other than this are the sights the time demands. Now were it well to sacrifice seven unbroken bullocks of the herd, as many fitly chosen sheep of two years old. Thus speaks she to Aeneas, nor do they delay to do her sacred bidding, and the priestess calls the Teucrians into the lofty shrine. A vast cavern is scooped in the side of the Euboic cliff, with her lead in hundred wide passages by an hundred gates, whence peal forth as manifold the responses of the Sibyl. They had reached the threshold, when the maiden cries, it is time to inquire thy fate, the god, lo, the god. And even as she spoke thus in the gateway, suddenly countenance, nor colour or ranged dresses, stayed the same. Her wild heart heaves madly in her panting bosom, and she expands to sight, and her voice is more than mortal. Now the god breathes on her in nearer deity. Lingerest thou to vow and pray, she cries, Aeneas of Troy, lingerest thou for not till then will the vast portals of the spellbound house swing open. So spoke she, and sank to silence. A cold shiver ran through the Teucrian's iron frames, and the king pours heart deep supplication. Phoebus, who hast ever pitied the sort of ale of Troy, who didst guide the Dardanian shaft from Paris, hand full on the son of Vicus, in thy leading have I pierced all these seas that skirt mighty lands, the Massilian nations far withdrawn and the fields the Cirque's fringe, thus far let the fortune of Troy follow us. You too may now unforbid and spare the nation of Pergama, gods and goddesses to whomsoever Ilium and the great glory of Dardania did wrong. And thou, O prophetess most holy, forenower of the future, grant, for no unearned realm does my destiny claim, a resting place in Latium to the Teucrians, to their wandering gods and the storm-tossed deities of Troy. Then will I ordain to Phoebus and Trivia a temple of solid marble, and festal days in Phoebus' name. The likewise a mighty sanctuary awaits in a realm. For here will I place thine oracles and the secrets of destiny uttered to my people, and consecrate chosen men, O gracious one. Only commit not thou thy verses to leaves, lest they fly disordered, the sport of rushing winds. Thyself utter them, I beseech thee. His lips made an end of utterance. But the prophetess, not yet tame to Phoebus' hand, 
rages fiercely in the cavern, so she may shake the mighty godhead from her breast. So much the more does he tire her maddened mouth and subdue her wild breast and shape her to his pressure. And now the hundred mighty portals of the house open of their own accord, and bring through the air the answer of a soothsayer, O past at length with the great perils of the sea. Though heavier yet by land away thee, the Dardanians shall come to the realm of Lavinium, relieve thy heart of this care, but not so shall they have joy of their coming. Wars, grim wars I discern, and Tiber afoam with streams of blood. A Simwa shall not fail thee, a Xanthus, a Dorian camp, another Achilles is already found for Latium, he too goddess born, nor shall Juno's presence ever leave the Teucrians, while thou in thy need, to what nations or what towns of Italy shalt thou not sue? Again as an alien bride, the source of all the Teucrian woe, again a foreign marriage chamber. Yield not thou to distresses, but all the bolder go forth to meet them, as thy fortune shall allow thee way. The path of rescue, little as thou deemest it, shall first open from a Grecian town. In such words the Sibyl of Kumi chants from the shrine her perplexing terrors, echoing through the cavern truth wrapped in obscurity, so does Apollo clash the reins and ply the goad in her maddened breast. So soon as the spasm ceased and the raving lips sank to silence, Aeneas the hero begins, no shape of toil, O maiden, rises strange or sudden on my sight, all this ere now have I guessed and inly rehearsed in spirit. One thing I pray, since here is the gate named of the infernal king, and the darkling marsh of Acheron's overflow, be it given me to go to my beloved father, to see him face to face, teach thou the way, and open the consecrated portals. Him on these shoulders I rescued from encircling flames and a thousand pursuing weapons, and brought him safe from amid the enemy. He accompanied my way over all the seas, and bore with me all the threats of ocean and sky, in weakness, beyond his age's strength and due. Nay, he it was who besought and enjoined me to seek thy grace and draw nigh thy courts. Have pity, I beseech thee, on son and father, O gracious one, for thou art all-powerful, nor in vain hath Hecate given thee rule in the groves of Avernus. If Orpheus could call up his wife's ghost in the strength of his Thracian lyre and the music of the strings, if Polyphus redeemed his brother by exchange of death, and passes and repasses so often, why make mention of great Theseus? Why of Alcides? I too am of Jove's sovereign race. In such words he pleaded and clasped the altars, when the soothsayer thus began to speak, O sprung of God's blood, child of anchises of Troy, easy is the descent into hell, all night and day the gate of darkness stands open, but to recall thy steps and issue to upper air, this is the task in burden. Some few of God's lineage have availed, such as Jupiter's gracious favour or virtuous ardour hath upborne to heaven. Midway all is muffled in forest, and the black coils of Cossetus circle it round. Yet if thy soul is so passionate and so desirous twice to float across the Stygian lake, twice to see dark Tartarus, and thy pleasure is to plunge into the mad task, learn what must first be accomplished. Hidden in a shady tree is a bough with leafage and pliant shoot all of gold, consecrate to nether Juno, wrapped in the depth of woodland and shut in by dim dusky veils. But to him only who first hath plucked the golden tressed fruitage from the tree is it given to enter the hidden places of the earth. This hath beautiful Proserpine ordained to be born to her for her proper gift. The first torn away, a second fills the place in gold, and the spray burgeons with even such ore again. So let thine eyes trace it home, and thine hand pluck it duly when found, for lightly and unreluctant will it follow if thine is fatty's summons, else will no strength of thine avail to conquer it nor hard steel to cut it away. Yet again, a friend of thine lies a lifeless corpse, alas! Thou knowest it not, and defiles all the fleet with death, while thou seekest to her counsel and lingerest in her courts. First lay him in his resting place and hide him in the tomb, lead thither black cattle, be this first thine expiation, so at last shalt thou behold the Stygian groves and the realm untrodden of the living. She spoke, and her lips shut to silence. Aeneas goes forth, and leaves the cavern with fixed eyes and sad countenance, his soul revolving only the unseen issues. By his side goes faithful Aites, and plants his footsteps in equal perplexity. Long they ran on in mutual change of talk, of what lifeless comrade spoke the soothsayer, of what body for burial. 
and even as they came, they see on the dry beach Missiness cut off by untimely death. Missiness the Eolid, excelled of none other in stirring men with brazen breath and kindling battle with his trumpet note. He had been attendant on mighty Hector. In Hector's train he waged battle, renowned delight for bugle and spear. After victorious Achilles robbed him of life, the valiant hero had joined Dardanian Aeneas company, and followed no meaner leader. But now, while he makes his hollow shell echo over the seas, a fool, and calls the gods to rival his blast, jealous Triton, if belief is due, had caught him among the rocks and sunk him in the foaming waves. So all surrounded him with loud murmur and cries, good Aeneas the foremost. Then weeping they quickly hastened on the Sibyl's orders, and work hard to pile trees for the altar of burial, and heap it up into the sky. They move into the ancient forest, the deep coverts of game, pitch pines fall flat, ilex rings to the stroke of axes, and ashen beams and ochre split in clefts with wedges. They roll in huge mountain ashes from the hills. Aeneas, likewise, is first in the work, and cheers on his crew and arms himself with their weapons. And alone with his sad heart he ponders it all, gazing on the endless forest, and utters this prayer, if but now the power of gold would shew itself to us on the tree in this depth of woodland. Since all the soothsayer's tale of thee, missiness, was, alas, too truly spoken. Scarcely had he said thus, when twin doves haply came flying down the sky, and lit on the green sod right under his eyes. Then the kingly hero knows them for his mother's birds, and joyfully prays, I'll be my guides, if way there be, and direct your airy passage, into the groves where the rich bow overshadows the fertile ground. And thou, O goddess mother, fail not her wavering fortune. So spoke he and stayed his steps, marking what they signify, whither they urge their way. Feeding and flying they advance at such distance as following eyes could keep them in view. Then, when they came to Avernus' pestilent gorge, they tower swiftly, and sliding down through the liquid air, choose their seat in light side by side on a tree, through whose boughs shone out the contrasting flicker of gold. As in chill midwinter the woodland is wont to blossom with the strange leafage of the mistletoe, so on an alien tree and wreathing the smooth stems with burgeoning saffron, so on the shadowy ilex seemed that leafy gold, so the foil tinkled in the light breeze. Immediately Aeneas seizes it and eagerly breaks off its resistance, and carries it beneath the Sibyl's roof. And therewithal the Teucrians on the beach wept missiness, and bore the last rites to the thankless ashes. First they build up a vast pyre of resinous billets in sawn oak, whose sides they entwine with dark leaves and plant funereal cypresses in front, and adorn it above with his shining armour. Some prepare warm water in cauldrons bubbling over the flames, and wash and anoint the chill body, and make their moan, then, their weeping done, lay his limbs on the pillow, and spread over it crimson raiment, the accustomed pall. Some uplift the heavy beer, a melancholy service, and with averted faces in their ancestral fashion hold and thrust in the torch. Gifts of frankincense, food, and bowls of olive oil, are poured and piled upon the fire. After the embers sank in and the flame died away, they soaked with wine the remnant of thirsty ashes, and Corineus gathered the bones and shut them in an urn of brass, and he too thrice encircled his comrades with fresh water, and cleansed them with light spray sprinkled from a bower of fruitful olive, and spoke the last words of all. But good Aeneas heaps a mighty mounded tomb over him, with his own armour and his oar and trumpet, beneath a ski mountain that now is called Missiness after him, and keeps his name immortal from age to age. This done, he hastens to fulfil the Sibyl's ordinance. A deep cave yawned dreary and vast, shingle-strewn, sheltered by the black lake and the gloom of the forests. Over it no flying things could wing their way unharmed, such a vapour streamed from the dark gorge and rose into the overarching sky. Here the priestess first arrays four black-bodied bullocks and pours wine upon their forehead, and plucking the topple spheres from between the horns, lays them on the sacred fire for first offering, calling aloud on Hecate, mistress of heaven and hell. Others lay knives beneath, and catch the warm blood in cups. Aeneas himself smites with the sword a black-fleeced shilam to the mother of the Eumenides and her mighty sister, and a barren heifer, Proserpine, to thee. Then he eucharist darkling altars to the Stygian king, and lays whole carcasses of bulls upon the flames, pouring fat oil over the blazing entrails. And lo, 
about the first rays of sunrise, the ground moaned underfoot, and the woodland ridges began to stir, and dogs seemed to howl through the dusk as the goddess came. Apart, ah, keep apart, O oh, ye yeah, unsanctified, cries the soothsayer, retire from all the grove, and thou, stride on an unsheath thy steel. Now is need of courage, O oh, Aeneas, now of strong resolve. So much she spoke, and plunged madly into the cavern's opening. He with unflinching steps keeps pace with his advancing guide. Gods who are sovereign over souls, silent ghosts, and chaos and fleech them, the wide dumb realm of night. As I have heard, so let me tell, and according to your will unfold things sunken deep under earth in gloom. They went darkling through the dusk beneath the solitary night, through the empty dwellings and bodeless realm of Dis. Even as one walks in the forest beneath the jealous light of a doubtful moon, when Jupiter shrouds the sky in shadow and black night blots out the world. Right in front of the doorway and in the entry of the jaws of hell grief and avenging cares have made their bed. There dwell wan sicknesses and gloomy eld, and fear, and ill-counselling hunger, and loathly want, shapes terrible to see, and death and travail, and thereby sleep, death skins man, and the soul's guilty joys, and death dealing warful in the gateway, and the furies in their iron cells, and mad discord with blood-stained fillets enwreathing her serpent locks. Midway an elm, shadowy and high, spreads her boughs and secular arms, where, one saith, idle dreams dwell clustering, and cling under every leaf, and monstrous creatures besides, many and diverse, keep covert at the gates, centaurs and twice-shaped Silas, and the hundredfold Briareus, and the beast of Lerna hissing horribly, and the Chimaira armed with flame, gorgons and harpies, and the body of the Triform Shade. Here Aeneas snatches at his sword in a sudden flutter of terror, and turns the naked edge on them as they come, and did not his wise fellow passenger remind him that these lives flit thin and unessential in the hollow mask of body, he would rush on and vainly lash through phantoms with his steel. Hence a road leads to Tartarus and Acheron's wave. Here the dreary pool swirls thick in muddy eddies and disgorges into Cossetus with its load of sand. Charon, the dread ferryman, guards these flowing streams, ragged and awful, his chin covered with untrimmed masses of hoary hair, and his glassy eyes aflame, his soiled raiment hangs knotted from his shoulders. Himself he plies the pole and trims the sails of his vessel, the steel blue galley with freight of dead, stricken now in years, but a god's old age is lusty and green. Hither all crowded, and rushed streaming to the bank, matrons and men and high-hearted heroes, dead and done with life, boys and unwedded girls, and children laid young on the bier before their parents' eyes, multitudinous as leaves fall dropping in the forests at autumn's earliest frost, or birds swarm landward from the deep gulf, when the chill of the year routes them overseas and drives them to sunny lands. They stood pleading for the first passage across, and stretched forth passionate hands to the farther shore. But the grim sailor admits now one and now another, whilst him he pushes back far apart on the strand. Moved with marvel at the confused throng, Say, O maiden, cries Aeneas, what means this flocking to the river? Of what are the souls so fain? Or what difference makes these retire from the banks, those go with sweeping oars over the leaden waterways? To him the long-lived priestess, thus briefly returned, Seed of Anchises, most sure progeny of gods. Thou seest the deep pools of Cossetus and the Stygian marsh, by whose divinity the gods fear to swear falsely. All this crowd thou discernest is helpless and unspultured. Charon is the ferryman, they who ride on the wave found a tomb. Nor is it given to cross the awful banks and hoarse streams, ere the dust hath found a resting place. An hundred years they wander here flitting about the shore, then at last they gain entrance, and revisit the pools so sorely desired. Anchise's son stood still, and ponderingly stayed his footsteps, pitying at heart their cruel lot. There he discerns, mournful and unhonored dead, Lucaspis and Orontes, captains of the Lysan squadron, whom, as they sailed together from Troy over gusty seas, the south wind overwhelmed and wrapped the waters round ship and men. Lo, there went by Palinurus the steersman, who of late, while he watched the stars on their Libyan passage, had slipped from the stern and fallen amid the waves. To him, when he first knew the melancholy form in the depth of shade, he thus opened speech. What god, O Palinurus, reft thee from us and sank thee amid the seas? 
forth and tell. For in this single answer Apollo deceived me, never found false before, when he prophesied thee safety on ocean, and arrival on the Ausonian coasts. See, is this his promise keeping? And he, neither did Phoebus on his oracular seat delude thee, O prince, Anchise's son, nor did any god drown me in the sea. For while I clung to my appointed charge and governed her course, I pulled the tiller with me in my fall, and the shock as I slipped drenched it away. By the rough seas I swear, fear for myself never wrung me so sore as for thy ship, lest, the rudder lost and the pilot struck away, those gathering waves might master it. Three wintry nights in the water the blustering south drove me over the endless sea, scarcely on the fourth dawn I discreet Italy as I rose on the climbing wave. Little by little I swam shoreward, already I clung safe, but while, encumbered with my dripping raiment, I caught with crooked fingers at the jagged needles of mountain rock, the barbarous people attacked me in arms and ignorantly deemed me a prize. Now the wave holds me, and the winds toss me on the shore. By heaven's pleasant light and breezes I beseech thee, by thy father, by Eulis thy rising hope, rescue me from these distresses, O unconquered one, either do thou, for thou canst, cast earth over me and again seek the haven of Velia, or do thou, if in any wise that may be, if in any wise the goddess who bore thee shews away, for not without divine will do I deem thou, old floater across these vast rivers, and the Stygian pool, lend me a pitying hand, and bear me over the waves in thy company, that at least in death I may find a quiet resting place. Thus he ended, and the soothsayer thus began, Whence, O Palinurus, this fierce longing of thine, shalt thou without peril behold the Stygian waters, and the awful river of the Furies, cease to hope prayers may bend the decrees of heaven, but take my words to thy memory, for comfort in thy woeful case, Far and wide shall the bordering cities be driven by celestial portents to appease thy dust. They shall rear a tomb, and pay the tomb a yearly offering, and forevermore shall the place keep Palinurus' name. The words soothed away his distress, and for a while drove grief away from his sorrowing heart. He is glad in the land of his name. So they complete their journey's beginning, and draw nigh the river. Just then the watermen discreet them from the Stygian wave advancing through the silent woodland and turning their feet towards the bank, and opens on them in these words of challenge, O so thou art, who marchest in arms towards a river, forth and say, there as thou art, why thou comest, and stay thine advance. This is the land of shadows, of sleep, and slumberous night, no living body may the Stygian hull convey, nor truly had I joy of taking Alcides on the lake for passenger. Nor Theseus and Pyrrhus, born of gods though they were an unconquered in might. He laid fettering hand on the warder of Tartarus, and dragged him cowering from the throne of my lord the king, the essay to ravish her mistress from the bridal chamber of Dis. Thereto the Amphrasian soothsayer made brief reply, No such plot is here, be not moved, nor do our weapons offer violence, the huge gatekeeper may bark on forever in his cavern and affright the bloodless ghosts, Proserpine may keep her honour within her uncle's gates. Aeneas of Troy, renowned in goodness as in arms, goes down to meet his father in the deep shades of Erebus. If the sight of such affection stirs thee in now eyes, yet this bow, she discovers the bow hidden in her raiment, thou must know. Then his heaving breast allays its anger, and he says no more, but marvelling at the awful gift, the fated rod so long unseen, he steers in his dusky vessel and draws to shore. Next he routes out the souls that sate on the long benches, and clears the thwarts, while he takes mighty Aeneas on board. The galley groaned under the weight in all her seams, and the marsh water leaped fast in. At length Prophetess and Prince are landed unscathed on the ugly ooze and livid sedge. This realm rings with the triple-throated being of vast Cerberus, couched huge in the cavern opposite, to whom the Prophetess, seeing the serpents already bristling up on his neck, throws a cake made slumberous with honey and drugged grain. He, with threefold jaws gaping in ravenous hunger, catches it when thrown, and sinks to earth with monstrous body outstretched, and sprawling huge over all his den. The warder overwhelmed, Aeneas makes entrance, and quickly issues from the bank of the irrimable wave. Immediately wailing voices are loud in their ears, the souls of babies crying on the doorway sill, whom, torn from the breast and portionless in life's sweetness, a dark day cut off and drowned in bitter death. 
Hard by them are those condemned to death on false accusation. Neither indeed are these dwellings assigned without lot and judgment. Minos presides and shakes the urn. He summons a council of the silent people, and inquires of their lives and charges. Next in order have these mourners, their place whose own innocent hands dealt them death, who flung away their souls in hatred of the day. How fain were they now in upper air to endure their poverty and sore travail. It may not be, the unlovely pool locks them in her gloomy wave, and sticks bars her ninfold barrier between. And not far from here are shewn stretching on every side the wailing fields, so they call them by name. Here they whom pitiless love hath, wasted in cruel decay, hide among untrodden ways, shrouded in embosoming myrtle thicket. Not death itself ends their distresses. In this region he discerns Phaedra and Procris and woefully Raphael, shewing on her the wounds of her merciless son, and of Edna and Pasiphae. Laodamia goes in their company, and she who was once sinus, and a man, now woman, and again returned by fate into her shape of old. Among whom Dido the Phoenician, fresh from her death wound, wandered in the vast forest. By her the Trojan hero stood, and knew the dim form through the darkness, even as the moon at the month's beginning to him who sees or thinks he sees her rising through the vapours. He let tears fall, and spoke to her lovingly and sweet. Alas, Dido, so the news was true that reached me, thou didst perish, and the sword sealed thy doom. Ami, was I cause of thy death, by the stars I swear by the heavenly powers and all that is sacred beneath the earth, unwillingly, O Queen, I left thy shore. But the gods, at whose orders now I pass through this shadowy place, this land of mouldering overgrowth and deep night, the gods' commands drove me forth, nor could I deem my departure would bring thee pain so great as this. Stay thy footstep, and withdraw not from our gaze. From whom flist thou? The last speech of thee fate ordains me as this. In such words, and with starting tears, Aeneas soothed the burning and fear-side soul. She turned away with looks fixed fast on the ground, stirred no more in countenance by the speech he essays, than if she stood in iron flint or marpesian stone. At length she started, and fled wrathfully into the shadowy woodland, where Sirius, her ancient husband, responds to her distresses and equals her affection. Yet Aeneas, dismayed by her cruel doom, follows her far on her way with pitying tears. Thence he pursues his appointed path, and now they trod those utmost fields where the renowned in war have their haunt apart. Here Tydeus meets him, here Parthenopeus, glorious in arms, and the pallid phantom of Adrastus. Here the Dardanians, long wet on earth and fallen in the war, sighing he discerns all their long array, Glaucus and Medon and Thersilochus, the three children of Antenor, and Polyphotis, Ceres priest, and Adeus yet charioted, yet grasping his arms. The souls throng round him to right and left, nor is one look enough. Lingering delighted, they pace by his side and inquire wherefore he is come. But the princes of the Gretchen's and Agamemnon's armies, when they see him glittering in arms through the gloom, hurry terror stricken away. Some turn backward, as when of old they fled to the ships. Some raise their voice faintly, and gasp out a broken ineffectual cry. And here he saw Diphobus son of Priam, with face cruelly torn, face in both hands, and airs lopped from his mangled temples, and nostrils maimed by a shameful wound. Barely he knew the cowering form that hid its dreadful punishment. Then he springs to accost it in familiar speech. Diphobus mighty in arms, seed of Chaucer's royal blood, whose wantonness of vengeance was so cruel. Who was allowed to use thee thus? Rumour reached me that on the last night, outwearied with endless slaughter, thou hadst sunk on the heap of mingled carnage. Then my own hand reared an empty tomb on the Roatian shore, my own voice thrice called aloud upon thy ghost. Thy name and armour keep the spot, thee, O oh my friend, I could not see nor lay in the native earth I left. Where to the son of Priam, in nothing, O oh my friend, wert thou wanting? Thou hast paid the fool to die, Phobus, and the dead man's shade. But me, my fate, and the Laconian woman's murderous guilt, must drag down to doom. These are the records of her leaving. For how we spent that last night in delusive gladness thou knowest, and must needs remember too well. When the fated horse leapt down on the steep towers of Troy, bearing armed infantry for the burden of its womb, she, in feigned procession, led round her Phrygian women with bacchic cries, 
Herself she euchred a mighty flame amid them, and called the Gretchens out of the fortress height. Then was I fast in mine ill-fated bridal chamber, deep asleep and outworn with my charge, and lay overwhelmed in slumber sweet and profound and most like to easeful death. Meanwhile that crown of wives removes all the arms from my dwelling, and slips out the faithful sword from beneath my head. She calls Menelaus into the house and flings wide the gateway, be sure she hoped her lover would magnify the gift, and so she might quench the fame of her ill deeds of old. Why do I linger? They burst into the chamber, they and the Iolid, counsellor of crime, in their company. Gods, recompense the Greeks even thus, if with righteous lips I call for vengeance. But come, tell in turn what hap hath brought thee hither yet alive. Comest thou driven on ocean wanderings, or by promptings from heaven, or what fortune keeps thee from rest, that thou shouldst draw nigh these sad sunless dwellings, this disordered land. In this change of talk dawn had already crossed heaven's mid-axle on her rose charioted way, and haply had they thus drawn out all the allotted time, but the civil made brief warning speech to her companion. Night falls, Aeneas, we waste hours in weeping. Here is the place where the road disparts. By this the truns to the right under great dis city is our path to Elysium, but the leftward wreaks vengeance on the wicked and sends them to unrelenting hell. But Diphobus, be not angered, mighty priestess, I will depart, I will refill my place and return into darkness. Go, glory of our people, go, enjoy a fairer fate than mine. Thus much he spoke, and on the word turned away his footsteps. Aeneas looks swiftly back, and sees beneath the cliff on the left hand a wide city, girt with a triple wall and encircled by a racing river of boiling flame, Tartarian Flegethan, that echoes over its rolling rocks. In front is the gate, huge and pillared with solid adamant, that no warring force of men nor the very habitants of heaven may avail to overthrow. It stands up a tower of iron, and Tisiphone sitting girt in blood-stained pall keeps sleepless watch at the entry by night and day. Hence moans are heard and fierce lashes resound, with the clank of iron and dragging chains. Aeneas stopped and hung dismayed at the tumult. What shapes of crime are here? Declare, O maiden, or what the punishment that pursues them, and all this upsurging wail? Then the soothsayer thus began to speak, Illustrious chief of Troy, no pure foot may tread these guilty courts, but to me Hecate herself, when she gave me a rule over the groves of Avernus, taught how the gods punish, and guided me through all her realm. Nogian Rhodomanthus here holds unrelaxing sway, chastises secret crime revealed, and exacts confession. Whereas over in the upper world, one vainly exultant, in stolen guilt, hath till the dusk of death kept clear from the evil he wrought. Straightway avenging Tisiphone, girt with her scourge, tramples down the shivering sinners, menaces them with the grim snakes in her left hand, and summons forth her sisters in merciless drain. Then at last the sacred gates are flung open and grate on the jarring hinge. Markest thou what sentry is seated in the doorway? What shape guards the threshold? More grim within sits the monstrous Hydra with her fifty black yawning throats, and Tartarus self gapes, sheer and strikes into the gloom through twice the space that one looks upward to Olympus and the ski heaven. Here are say ancient children, the titans brood, hurled down by the thunderbolt, lie wallowing in the abyss. Here likewise I saw the twin alloids, enormous of frame, who essayed with violent hands to pluck down high heaven and thrust Jove from his upper realm. Likewise I saw Salminus, in the cruel payment he gives for mocking Jove's flame in Olympus thunders. Born by four horses and brandishing a torch, he rode in triumph midway through the populous city of Grecian Elis, and claimed for himself the worship of deity, madman, who would mimic the storm cloud, and the inimitable bolt with brass that rang under his trampling horse hoofs. But the Lord Omnipotent hurled his shaft through thickening clouds, no fire brand his nor smoky glare of torches, and dashed him headlong in the fury of the whirlwind. There with Altitios might be seen, fosterling of earth the mother of all, whose body stretches over nine full acres, and a monstrous vulture with crooked beak eats away the imperishable liver and the entrails that breed in suffering and plunges deep into the breast that gives it food and dwelling, nor is any rest given to the fibres that ever grow on you. Why tell of the Lapidae, of Ixion and Pyrrhus, over whom a stone hangs just slipping and just as though it fell? 
or the high banqueting couches gleam golden pillared, and the feast is spread in royal luxury before their faces, couched hard by the eldest of the Furies wards the tables from their touch and rises with torch euchred and thunderous lips. Here are they who hated their brethren while life endured, or struck a parent or entangled a client in wrong, or who brooded alone over found treasure and shared it not with their fellows, this the greatest multitude of all, and they who were slain for adultery, and who followed unrighteous arms, and feared not to betray their master's plighted hand. Imprisoned they await their doom, seek not to be told the doom, that fashion of fortune wherein they are sunk. Some roll a vast stone, or hang outstretched on the spokes of wheels. Hapless Theseus sits and shall sit forever, and Phlegius in his misery gives counsel to all and witnesses aloud through the gloom, learn by this warning to do justly and not to slight the gods. This man sold his country for gold, and laid her under a tyrant's sway. He set up and pulled down laws at a price. This other forced his daughter's bridal chamber and a forbidden marriage. All dared some monstrous wickedness, and had success in what they dared. Not had I an hundred tongues, an hundred mouths, and a voice of iron, could I sum up all the shapes of crime, or name over all their punishments. Thus spoke Phoebus, long live priestess, then, but come now, she cries, haste on the way and perfect the service begun, let us go faster, I descry the ramparts cast in cyclopean furnaces, and in front the arched gateway where they bid us lay the gifts for he ordained. She ended, and advancing side by side along the shadowy ways, they pass over and draw nigh the gates. Aeneas makes entrance, and sprinkling his body with fresh water, plants the bowful in the gateway. Now at length, this fully done, and the service of the goddess perfected, they came to the happy place, the green pleasances and blissful seats of the fortunate woodlands. Here an ampler air clothes the meadows in lustrous sheen, and they know their own sun, and a starlight of their own. Some exercise their limbs in tournament on the greensard, contend in games, and wrestle on the yellow sand. Some dance with beating footfall and lips that sing. With them is the Thracian priest in sweeping robe, and makes music to their measures with the notes sevenfold interval, the notes struck now with his fingers, now with his ivory rod. Here is Chaucer's ancient brood, a generation excellent in beauty, high-hearted heroes born in happier years, Ilus and Asaricus, and Dardanus, founder of Troy. Afar he marvels at the armour and chariots empty of their lords. Their spears stand fixed in the ground, and their unyoked horses pasture at large over the plain. Their life's delight in chariot and armour, their care in pasturing their sleek horses, follows them in likewise low under earth. Others, lo, he beholds feasting on the sward to right and left, and singing in chorus the glad paean cry, within a scented laurel grove when Seridanus river surges upward full volume through the wood. Here is the band of them who bore wounds in fighting for their country, and they who were pure in priesthood while life endured, and the good poets whose speech are based not Apollo, and they who made life beautiful by the arts of their invention, and who won by service a memory among men, the brows of all girt with the snow white fully. To their encircling throng the civil spoke thus, and to Musaeus before them all, for he is midmost of all the multitude, and stands out head and shoulders among their upward gaze. Tell, O blissful souls, and thou, poet most gracious, what region, what place hath Anchises for his own? For his sake are we come, and have sailed across the wide rivers of Erebus. And to her the hero thus made brief reply, None hath a fixed dwelling, we live in the shady woodlands, soft swelling banks and meadows fresh with streams are our habitation. But you, if this be your heart's desire, scale this ridge, and I will even now set you on an easy pathway. He spoke, and paced on before them, and from above shews the shining plains, thereafter they leave the mountain heights. But Lord Danchises, deep in the green valley, was musing in earnest survey over the imprisoned souls destined to the daylight above and haply reviewing his beloved children, and all the tale of his people, them and their fates and fortunes, their works and ways. And he, when he saw Aeneas advancing to meet him over the greensard, stretched forth both hands eagerly, while tears rolled over his cheeks, and his lips parted in a cry, Art thou come at last, and hath thy love, O child of my desire, conquered the difficult road? Is it granted, O my son, 
to gaze on thy face and hear an answer in familiar tones. Thus indeed I forecast in spirit, counting the days between, nor hath my care misled me. What lands, what space of seas hast thou traversed to reach me, through what surge of perils, O my son? How I dreaded the realm of Libya might work thee harm. And he, thy melancholy phantom, thine, O my father, came before me often and often, and drove me to steer to these portals. My fleet is anchored on the Tyrrhenian brine. Give thine hand to clasp, O my father, give it, and withdraw not from her embrace. So spoke he, his face wet with abundant weeping. Thrice there did he essay to fling his arms about his neck. Thrice the phantom vainly grasped fled out of his hands even as light wind, and most like to fluttering sleep. Meanwhile Aeneas sees deep withdrawn in the covert of the vale of woodland and rustling forest thickets, and the river of Leth that floats past their peaceful dwellings. Around it flitted nations and peoples innumerable, even as in the meadows when in clear summer weather bees settle on the variegated flowers and stream round the snow-white lilies, all the plain is murmurous with their humming. Aeneas starts at the sudden view, and asks the reason he knows not. What are those spreading streams? Or who are they whose vast train fills the banks? Then Lord Danchises, souls, for whom second bodies are destined and you, drink at the wave of the Lehian stream, the heedless water of long forgetfulness. These of a truth have I long desired to tell and shew thee face to face, and number all the generation of thy children, that so thou mayest the more rejoice with me in finding it Lee. O father, must we think that any souls travel hence into upper air, and return again to bodily fetters? Why this their strange sad longing for the light? I will tell, rejoins and chises, nor will I hold thee in suspense, my son. And he unfolds all things in order one by one. First of all, heaven and earth and the liquid fields, the shining orb of the moon and the Titanian star, doth a spirit sustain in Lee, and a soul shed abroad in them sways all their members and mingles in the mighty frame. Thence is the generation of man and beast, the life of winged things, and the monstrous forms that ocean breeds under his glittering floor. Those seeds have fiery force and divine birth, so far as they are not clogged by taint of the body and dulled by earthy frames and limbs ready to die. Hence is it they fear and desire, sorrow and rejoice, nor can they pierce the air while barred in the blind darkness of their prison house. Nay, and when the last ray of life is gone, not yet, alas, does all their woe, nor do all the plagues of the body wholly leave them free, and needs must be that many a long and green evil should take root marvellously deep. Therefore they are schooled in punishment, and pay all the forfeit of a lifelong ill. Some are hung stretched to the viewless winds, some have the taint of guilt washed out beneath the dreary deep, or burned away in fire. We suffer, each a several ghost. Thereafter we are sent to the broad spaces of Elysium, some few of us to possess the happy fields, till length of days completing time's circle, heats out the ingrained soiler and leaves untainted the ethereal sense and pure spiritual flame. All these before thee, when the wheel of a thousand years hath come fully round, a god summons in vast terrain to the river of Lev, that so they may regain in forgetfulness the slopes of upper earth, and begin to desire to return again into the body. Anchois is ceased, and leads his son, and the sibyl likewise amid the assembled murmurous throng, and mounts a hill whence he might scan all the long ranks and learn their countenances as they came. Now come, the glory hereafter to follow our Dardanian progeny, the posterity to abide in our Italian people, illustrious souls and inheritors of our name to be, these will I rehearse, and instruct thee of thy destinies. He yonder, seest thou, the warrior leaning on his pointless spear, holds the nearest place allotted in our groves, and shall rise first into the air of heaven from the mingling blood of Italy, Silvius of Alban name, the child of thine age, whom late in thy length of days thy wife Lavinia shall nurture in the woodland, king and father of kings, from him in Alba the long shall our house have dominion. He next him is Procas, glory of the Trojan race, and Capis and Numitor, and he who shall renew thy name, Silvius, Aeneas, eminent alike in goodness or in arms, if ever he shall receive his kingdom in Alba. Men of men, see what strength they display, and wear the civic o shading their brows. They shall establish Nomentum and Gabi and Fidina city, they the Calatine hill fortress, Pomete and the fort of Inos, Bola and Cora, 
these shall be names that are now nameless lands. Nay, Romulus, likewise, seed of mothers, shall join his grandsire's company, from his mother Elias nurture in Asaracus blood. Seest thou how the twin plumes straighten on his crest, and his father's own emblazonment already marks him for upper ear? Behold, O son, by his augury shall Rome, a renowned fill earth with her empire and heaven with her pride, and gird about seven fortresses with her single wall, prosperous mother of men, even as our lady of Berecentus rides in her chariot turret crowned through the Phrygian cities, glad in the gods she hath born, clasping an hundred of her children's children, all habitants of heaven, all dwellers on the upper heights. Hither now bend thy twin night gaze, behold this people, the Romans, that are thine. Here is Caesar and all Eulis, posterity that shall arise under the mighty cope of heaven. Here is he, he of whose promise once and again thou hearest, Caesar Augustus, a god's son, who shall again establish the ages of gold in Latium over the fields that once were Saturn's realm, and carry his empire afar to Garament in Indian, to the land that lies beyond our stars, beyond the sun's year-long ways, where Atlas the sky-bearer wheels on his shoulder the glittering star-spangled pole. Before his coming even now the kingdoms of the Caspian shudder at oracular answers, and the meotic land and the mouths of sevenfold Nile flutter in alarm. Nor indeed did Alcides traverse such spaces of earth, though he pierced the brazen-footed deer, or though he stilled the Arimanthian woodlands and made Lerna tremble at his bow. Nor he who sways his team with reins of vine, Liber the conqueror, when he drives his tigers from Nizah's lofty crest. And do we yet hesitate to give valour scope in deeds, or shrink in fear from setting foot on Ausonian land? And, and who is he apart, marked out with sprays of olive, offering sacrifice? I know the locks and hoary chin of the king of Rome, who shall establish the infant city in his laws, sent from little cure's sterile land to the majesty of empire. To him Tullus shall next succeed, who shall break the peace of his country and stir to arms men rusted from war and armies, now disused to triumphs, and hard on him over vaunting Ancus follows, even now too late in popular breath. Wilt thou see also the Tarquin kings, and the haughty soul of Brutus the Avenger, and the Fasces regained? He shall first receive a consul's power and the merciless axes, and when his children would stir fresh war, the father, for fair freedom's sake, shall summon them to doom. Unhappy, yet howsoever posterity shall take the deed, love of country and limitless passion for honour shall prevail. Nay, behold apart the Desi and the Drusi, Torquatus with his cruel axe, and Camillus returning with the standards. Yonder souls likewise, whom thou discernest gleaming in equal arms, at one now, while shut in night. Ami, what mutual war, what battle lines and bloodshed shall they arouse, so they attain the light of the living. Father-in-law descending from the Alpine barriers, and the fortress of the dweller alone, son-in-law facing him with the embattled east. Nay, O my children, harden not your hearts to such warfare, neither turn upon her own heart the mastering might of your country, and thou, be thou first to forgive, who drawest thy descent from heaven, cast down the weapons from thy hand, O blood of mine. He shall drive his conquering chariot to the Capitoline height triumphant over Corinth, glorious in alley and slaughter. He shall uproot Argos and Agamnonian Mycenae, and the Echides O'Neir, the seed of Achilles mighty in arms, avenging his ancestors in Troy and Minerva's polluted temple. Who might leave thee, lordly Cato, or thee, Cossus, to silence? Who the Gracchan family, or these two sons of the Scipios, a double thunderbolt of war, Libya's bail? and Fabricius potent in poverty, or thee, Serenus, sowing in the furrow. Whither whirl you me all breathless, O Fabi? Thou art he, the most mighty, the one man whose lingering retrieves our state. Others shall beat out the breathing bronze to softer lines, I believe it well. Shall draw living lineaments from the marble, the cause shall be more eloquent on their lips, their pencil shall portray the pathways of heaven, and tell the stars in their arising, be thy charge. O Roman, to rule the nations in thine empire, this shall be thine art, to lay down the law of peace, to be merciful to the conquered and beat the haughty down. This Lord Danchises, and as they marvel, he so pursues. Look how Marcellus the conqueror marches, glorious in the splendid spoils, towering high above them all. 
he shall stay the Roman state, reeling beneath the invading shock, shall ride down Carthaginian in insurgent Gaul, and a third time hang up the captured armour before Lord Quirinus. And at this Aeneas, for he saw going by his side one excellent, in beauty and glittering in arms, but his brow had little cheer, and his eyes looked down. Who, O oh my father, is he who thus attends him on his way, son, or other of his children's princely race? How his comrades murmur around him, how goodly of presence he is, but dark night flutters round his head with melancholy shade. Then Lord Danchises with welling tears began, O oh my son, ask not of the great sorrow of thy people. Him shall fate but shew to earth, and suffer not to stay further. Too mighty, lords of heaven, did you deem the brood of Rome, had this your gift been abiding? What moaning of men shall arise from the field of mothers by the imperial city? What a funeral train shall thou see, O Tiber, as thou flowest by the new-made grave? Neither shall the boyhood of any Avilian race raise his Latin forefathers hope so high, nor shall the land of Romulus ever boast of any fosterling like this. Alas his goodness, alas his antique honour, and right hand invincible in war. None had faced him unscathed in armed shock, whether he met the foe on foot, or ran his spurs into the flanks of his foaming horse. Ami, the pity of thee, O oh boy, if in any wise thou breakest the grim bar of fate, thou shalt be Marcellus. Give me lilies in full hands, let me stir bright blossoms, and these gifts at least let me lavish on my descendant soul, and do the unavailing service. Thus they wander up and down over the whole region of broad vaporous plains, and scan all the scene. And when Anchises had led his son over it, each point by each, and kindled his spirit with passion for the glories on their way, he tells him thereafter of the war he next must wage, and instructs him of the Laurentine peoples and the city of Latinus, and in what wise each task may be turned aside or borne. There are twin portals of sleep, weary of the one is fabled of horn, and by it real shadows are given easy outlet, the other shining white of polished ivory, but false visions issue upward from the ghostly world. With these words, then Anchises follows forth his son and the sibyl together there, and dismisses them by the ivory gate. He pursues his way to the ships and revisits his comrades, then bears on to Kiaita's haven straight along the shore. The anchor is cast from the prow, the sterns are grounded on the beach. Thank you for watching. We look forward to seeing you again for book 7 of the Aeneid.